was primarily at that time was a uh, attorney collar and be a counselor. Not counselor wasn't as famous back then as he grew to be. But basically that was the what we call the uh, the goal side of it, or the money side of the movement was the American Civil Liberties Union. So as the movement itself started um, by being a student or an ex-student in those two individual classes, people have a tendency to reach out, you know, to people they know, like Mr. Ms. Tremens. He was always getting these calls, because most people thought that Dr. Tremens still was president. So they was wanting to come to Montgomery. So my role primarily for her was to make sure somebody came in the airport that you get them, you know, get them to where they need to be when the movement actually started after the Bloody Sunday. A lot of those people wanted to go to Selma. And so, so her friends, uh, that was my job basically to make sure that you get them from the airport, you get them to Selma and back safely. And uh, so, that, and then even on the day of, the, you know, leading up to the, uh, the week of the end of the march here, now we had a lot of folks, everybody from Ralph Bunch, and you can go on and on, those type of people, that, uh, well, you make sure you get these folks from the airport. Most of them want to go to Selma, even though the marches was primarily here. So that's the reason a lot of people look at me and say, well, what is that? But Clay, you know, we well, haven't seen him marching anywhere now. You haven't seen me marching anywhere, but I put many, many miles on silver cars down the movement. And uh, that was primarily my role. Uh, the thing that was significant, I guess, with the cars, I was always fortunate that I had fast cars <laughs> and, uh, and new cars. I had a situation when I buy one, I always try to make sure I could sell it before <laughs> the payment came due. <laughs> and uh, also, you know, you get so many tickets and, you know, the police start, you know, they start knowing your car. So I had two motivations, to hurry up and get out of this one and uh, get in another one. Uh, before they find out which one this one is. Even on the day of the march, I was fortunate to uh, you know, get out of the ones that were leading up to that. I think I got it the day before the march, and they didn't have a tag on it. So, uh, But anyway, that was kind of the, the role. With the Carter situation, it is a, it's a very unique piece of history that unfortunately I think that uh, it's kind of gotten buried because at the time I was a student of his, the Reeves case, even though the Jeremiah Reeves had been uh, executed, there was still a lot, you know, there was still a lot of interest in the case trying to get certain legislation passed, uh, particularly like the uh, equitable jury participation, because at the time that you, you know, Jeremiah Reeves went to his death in 1958, you know, there was no such thing about who did serve or who did not serve on the, on, on the jury. But at the same time, uh, there were some other cases that, that came in after 58, and the one that, that Colin was, was most involved in was the New York Times versus Sullivan, because he was, he was one of the attorneys that was on the staff of the American Civil Liberties Union. And so uh, that was a case that, you know, that's about all we heard, you know, in those classes. We heard a lot about that, you know, about how the case was, because we had gotten into this, but the decision came in the 19th. 1964, and uh, all of the, the case itself started in 1960. So, uh, so we got a, a you know good range size seat of what happened, and I mean I, who argued before the Supreme Court on that particular case. So we heard all the nuances of it over and over again. So at that time, the the, uh, the movement itself, as far as we can see, started was in 1965. Basically, it was a matter of that from the side of the American Civil Liberties Union. It was already in place because it had been here ever since probably 56 or so. And, um, and then with Ms. Trenton, she was still, in our minds, she was still first lady, about about State University. So basically, and also, uh, I had the good fortune of, uh, we had a change of NCAA government so in the middle of the year. And uh, so about being in the Student Government Association, and just like John, I think John, you was SGA president, right? I couldn't be a president because I, uh, because I was transferred students out. I wanted to be the treasurer of the uh, SGA during that time. And uh, pretty good position, you know. You know, we had good support for administration and everything. So, but it's 
been something that that's you know means a lot to me. The main thing, I guess, that's been most more motivating to me that here at Alabama State at this moment we have an opportunity to really document and validate the uh, particular voters' rights movement. And if you don't get it, you know, if what's so frustrating is that when you hear all the accounts, I think we have people still there that wouldn't even born to walk across the bridge with Dr. King uh, in 1965. And, uh, you know, I tell folks, you know, yeah, I drove across the bridge in 1965. I did not walk across it. I drove across it many, many times. Uh, so, you know, you can't drive and walk at the same time. So it's more important that you drive. So basically, a lot of people don't say, well, no, Dr. Boone, I take my hat off. He did more walking, and uh, I did no, no, because that wasn't my role. That wasn't, you know. And I, I think it was, you know, I, I think it was important because my life. I'll never forget on the the, the evening at the end of the march. Um, I got a call from my father that, that I had an aunt in in Connecticut that had passed, and he wanted me to go to Connecticut to represent the family. And so, ordinarily, I would have been going, you know, going all the way into Selma, but I told him, I said, well, I can, I can make, I told him, I had to do Miss Trenton's being, so I said, look, I can't make, I cannot go any further than, than the airport. I said, I, I can drop some people off in the airport. I have to go home because I don't have enough money to get to Connecticut and back. So I had to go home. And, uh, so it was really like the next day before I found out that Bauer DeRuzzo had been killed on 80 that same afternoon uh, because I wouldn't really, you know, listen to the radio or anything. Because, you know, this is like 2 o'clock. We had to go 100 miles out, get some money, get back, get on the road. And I think when I finally found out about it, was, I was probably in Baltimore someplace, you know. And, uh, and I said, my God. You know, I couldn't believe. But the strangest thing about it was after the death of Mr. Lee, you know, you look like everybody just left. You know, when I got back, a week ago, I really got snowed in. And, and, uh, so when I got back, of all the thousands of people that were here, look at everybody was just gone, because literally the thousands of people that were here, the majority of them were not Montgomery's. And the majority of the people that was there was not from Montgomery, because after Apparently, and I wouldn't hear the other bus boycott, but apparently after bus boycott, it looks like the business community was kind of indicted by many other places in the South for letting black folks go free in Montgomery in 1955. So that was a lot of economic pressure on individuals in this town after 1955, a lot of people. In fact, as a, a fuller page ad, in the, not the New York Times ad, but the Montgomery advertiser ad in the middle of the paper, that was saying, you know, stay out the streets. That is, that all these troublemakers will be going home tomorrow. And all those good folks in Montgomery, Alabama, you know, we got to get back and live together. And they have all these signatures. You have all of us fine folks that sign off on this thing. To keep the kids in school, don't let them out. Now, John, he, he played hook and all that. He went, you know, he, he was at the Book of Wisdom. You know, you can listen, but you know, really in some of the schools, the press was earning half an hour. They go, the other way, call. They gave a student that call probably went in here. But anyway, that, and that's the thing that most people miss, that that the difference in what happened in, apparently this time in 1955 and what happened in 1965 was almost 360 degrees difference. You know, we had organizations, we had ministers, groups that, you know, said, look, don't y'all, don't get your church involved in this, don't let these folks in your church and all this kind of stuff. In 1965, the men of the same churches and things that took a pair of the people in in 1955, you know, they did not. Frank Bray, Javon's partner at the, uh, at the county commission, our father was the one that really kind of saved it, you know, because Beulah was the largest church that really let folks in in 65. Frank had the key, he would share the uh, trustee board. And Dr. Alford, you know, I think he just kind of looked to the left, you know. So he, Beale was probably the largest church that really opened his doors, truly, for the movement in 1965. Uh, but it was a big difference because we 
I said, it looked like everybody left, but most of the people that were standing up in front of the Capitol that was estimated to 50,000 people. But, you know, when New York, when uh, my girl advertised the kind of people in 1965, if they said it was 50 out there, it was probably closer, you know, to 100. 100,000. They said 50,000. But after it was over, it looked like that everybody just left, left the city. Everything quiet down. The only thing that kept up, kept going, was us. Yeah, by mistake. That became the movement from then on. Because everybody else, you know, like I said, we, you know, and Dr. Boone could relate to that more than to me, perhaps, because you start getting the uh, expelled and everything. But however, you know, to Dr. Watkins, credit Dr. Watkins was very smart president. Very smart president. You know, he let the students do, you know, basically. Uh, you know, he had to do what he had to do to keep his job, and we understood that. But uh, as far as doing his role, I would say here, and I said public, and a lot of people said, Dr. Walker did this, not well. I tell you what, if Dr. Walker had not been president at that particular time, Alabama State would not be what you see today. Because George Wilder was still alive, and et cetera, and, um, you know, he was able to keep the institution together, he was able to keep the uh, the politics together. In fact, George Wallace ended up being, was he the commencement speaker, John? Yeah, he was speaking for commencement. So, you know, to bring him from where he had been to speaking over here, you know, that was, that was a good show for me. And then so, but anyway, basically that's sort of an overview as to how I got involved in the movement. And uh, then I just, one of those folks that came to my government school and never left. I'm still here. <laughs> Thank you, Representative. Representative Knight. Yes. I just want to um, interrupt for one second, please. I, you know, uh, again, a, an interesting component of, of being here in Montgomery is that when you have programs like this, you never know who's going to show up. And um, I just want to draw attention to uh, Joseph Peterson um, and J James McFadden. Both of these individuals were students at Alabama State in 1960 and participated in, in the sit-ins. And so, and, and all that emanated from that. Well, I'm glad you recognized me because I wanted to do so myself because I'm so proud of what they've done. And you know, one common thread to everything that's been said has been Alabama State University. And I think that we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to the university to keep that tradition. That's why I'm so glad that we have the research center, we have the interpretive center, and we have the wherewithal to continue to tell the story of what happened during that time. Now also, along with that, Reverend Boone, I can recall, and this is my recollection of it, being in high school, the principals, we owe them a debt of gratitude. Because I remember when y'all used to come down the hall at BTW and said, we're going to march today. And then we run out the building. <laughs> we didn't know where we were going or what we were going to do, but we're going to march. The main thing, we're getting out of class. I don't mind telling you. <laughs> and, and, and the principals kind of understood. And we participated, I know I did, in a number of marches that way because you would come through the building and nobody was going to do anything to you, anything of that nature. Uh, the principals just wouldn't say anything. we go. And we participate. And that's how we got the numbers in many cases uh, for, for many of those marches. The other thing, there's been so much transition here in Montgomery. I can recall, and those of you here, you can go back and look it up. You can look up the Todd Rowe case. You can look up the Bernard Whitehurst case. You can look up uh, one time when I was on the county commission, when you talk about voting rights, I had to take the county commission and the probate judge to court uh, to get a polling place at Newtown. Uh, that's a predominantly black area where they uh, were not going to have a polling place there for blacks to vote. So there's a lot to be told and a lot to be said about the many accomplishments that we have made here. But make no mistakes about it. There was no one person that did it by himself. Uh, it was a collective effort. Now, among that collected effort, did you have disagreements? Yes. Did you have misunderstandings? Yes. Did you have falling outs? Yes. Did you have divorces? Yes. You had everything that go along with just being a human being. All right. But
but uh, we, we managed to come out of all of it. And we managed to be very successful, in my opinion, in the things that we accomplished, and it helped people across the country. And even Alabama State right now is poised to be the leader in so many different ways. Amen. When you see the things that are taking place on this campus, and all of that is because of many of you in this room that's uh, made such a contribution in various ways in support of not only Alabama State, but the total movement, because it has been a movement. And Montgomery has been in the forefront of that movement, and the story must be told, uh, because so much originated here in Montgomery as it relates to rights. And that's the reason, and the irony about it is this, you see people coming from all over the world to come here to find out. Uh, I've been to some of those, to come just to ask questions. Tell me, how did it happen? How did it get started? Who participated? Uh, but many people right here each and every day uh, don't recognize the importance and the significance of it. Uh, the MIA played a major role. I see Reverend Dawkins back there. We, uh, all of us have been members of the MIA for many years. Reverend Grass, and we continue to work together uh, to try to bring, against, uh, bring together social change and justice here in the city. So uh, I, I think you want to have questions and answers. So at this time, we will open it up for any questions. Um, at Are there any questions? Uh, we have Dr. Autry, would you like the microphone? Uh, Dr. Robinson, uh, our panel is going to discuss their transition to electoral politics before yes. we get to the questions. Yes. Um, one, one, of the, one of the things that we wanted to, to look at was, um, one of the things that we wanted to look at was how you made the decision to make that transition. I know Reverend Boone, you ran for Congress. Um, Representative McClammy, you, you ran for a House seat. Um, and of course, Representative Knight also ran for a county commission seat and then a house seat. And you ran for, ran for Congress. So, so you, you, part of this, this generation or this cadre of, of activists who make that transition, could you talk a little bit about the decision to make the transition and, um, and, and what you thought you could accomplish um, in electoral politics that you could not accomplish as, a, as an activist? And I'm, I'm very glad you asked that, but uh, when I made a decision to run for office, uh, it was, um, I felt guilty. Felt guilty because it had been the policy of, of, of Dr. King. Uh, and he had uh, told all of us, you know, to stay free or clear of, of politics. Uh, you know, while we were doing our job, uh, because it was kind of a, a, a conflict. And, uh, but I tried it anyway, because I thought if I got to Congress, I could do more than introduce and bring into being a food stamp program uh, for just Montgomery. I felt that I could, uh, all of the soldiers that were out there who marched every night and every day, to bring us to where we are. Uh, they are still here in Montgomery, and a lot of them are still suffering. It, it, we paid a great price. Uh, when Dr. King left, uh, one of the last things that happened uh, after that period is that I met with them at the airport with Dr. King, Andrew Young, and Jose Williams. And, uh, <coughs> I had to answer the question of whether or not I would go with SCRC to continue the drive. And I chose not to do it because we had not completed uh, the job here in Montgomery. And that's the first time I ever got fired in my life. Got fired one day uh, by Jose Williams. Next day, hired by Andy Young again. Uh, so I, I was able to stay here and work with the Alabama Action Committee, 
you never hear that, but the Alabama Action Committee was, was here and, and working. And, uh, you know, it might disturb a lot of people, but I, I, I worked with, uh, for a great number of weeks, and the MIA, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the action that went on was, uh, you know, I was out there doing it. Um, and, and uh, you know, we've come to this point, and the effort of all of us involved in the movement uh, undergirds the black president who is now in office and who will be in the next term as well. So, you know, it, it, it was a pleasure, you know, uh, to work, but the woods are lovely, dark and deep, but we got miles to go before we sleep. It ain't no time to sleep. We haven't finished the job yet, and uh, I'm going to run again, but not for office. I'm going to run to get out there and to finish the job that I promised Dr. King that I would finish uh, if anything happened to him and all of the other people. A lot of soldiers have died and I have a commitment to keep going irrespective as to what happened. So these overalls will be around for the next two years if I'm living uh, and they mean exactly what they look like they mean. school, I was already a registered voter, even though I lived in Alabama. You know, I turned 18, and I was able to register. My, you know, my family was registered. The political side, really, like I said, was before we left, I got here, because my basically, we had a family that was what we call a networking family that extended from city. Well, my, my parents' basic space was New Orleans. Then the other cities like Chicago, Detroit, Cincinnati, Milwaukee, all the way to Hawaii, we had family members that were in business, St. Louis, Washington, D.C. So the whole political process was in play, even though it was on the, you know, it started back. My family, when it was, came into Alabama uh, in the 1870s, they came in, in business in Alabama in the 1870s. Uh, and so then, at that time, you know, it, 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 it had to be, it was about politics. It wasn't all our civil rights going on back then. So you have a mindset as to how, you know, that, that the whole process works. You know, and it's basically, you know, three prongs. You know, the basic civil rights, ultimately that, emerges into political rights, just like the top you have there, and then the ultimately, and the most difficult, is economic rights. And so, until the whole spectrum is completed, then as Dr. Boone said, it's, you know, the process is incomplete. And so, the whole concept of politics is that in order to provide ordinary, or just ordinary, not out of the ordinary, but ordinary, opportunities to our communities. There has to be a vehicle that will give you the possibility to enable a lot of positive things to happen in your community. And in my government, Alabama, I think it's only appropriate. I think one of the best economic models in the economic model in this community is pretty good as you go around. You know, you know when we look at some of the things that Representative Knight, myself, Representative Holmes, Representative and Dr. Boone have achieved in this community. A lot of people look at it, I think, I think sometimes people think things just rain out of heaven and they just happen. But if we look at the economy off of this community in the last 30 or so years, when we look at people whose quality of life, and I, never, I don't see a lot of me here, but when I look out, the door in the community and reflect on the quality of life as it is today compared to what it was 
policy in 1965, you know, it hasn't been bad. You know, when we look at, in this community, 10,000 high-tech, high-paying jobs at Hyundai and its various suppliers, when we look at the number of people that's on the public roster with the state of Alabama, primarily Representative Holmes, I'm not, he didn't send a speech for me, but I give him his due. There's not a single component in the state and public offices in this town that if he didn't get the job, well, I'm sure you do. Dr. Boone was out there for something that helped make it happen. And I can truthfully say, even when you look at Alabama State University, you know, as people drive down 85 now and they look at this miracle, you know, and everybody said, well, that's a fantastic facility. But let me assure you that when you look at the average historic black college in this country, you are not going to see the types of things on those campuses as you see here in this. And Mama Alabama is a black belt county. Now, we don't admit it. Most of us don't own up to it. But we're one of those black belt counties. So you don't find the type of resources throughout the community. That, and I can assure you that the political process did not impede any pro progress in this community. That it has been front and foremost. And, uh, and there's still a lot of work to go. And before I yield the mic, I sincerely believe that many of the games, and, I, and, and the evidence speaks for itself, we have achieved a lot in the last four to seven years. After 44 years, we put the 44th president in the White House. But now, the challenge we have today is the retrogression in these games. You know, we can start, we can start in cities like New York. We once had a minority, a black mayor in New York City. We once had, in Chicago, in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, in Oakland, California, in Charlotte, North Carolina in New Orleans, in Houston, in Dallas. So, in the legislature, we have seats that were held by black legislators for a number of years on both, in both bodies. We have a seat in the Alabama Senate today that was elected from a population of probably close to 70% black citizens. Same situation in Jefferson County, in Atlanta, Dr. Silver. The last mayor's race was pretty close, right? Oh, yes. Very close. The runoff was very close. And God knows, everybody talking about Washington, D.C., but Atlanta, Georgia is the capital. It's the international capital of the world. And when you see changes begin to shift in those communities, some problems, and some serious problems. The unfortunate thing is, when these types of changes come, it takes about 40 years to deal with them. It takes about 40 years to get to a point. You enjoy pros prosperity for about 40 years, and then you're at a point basically where we are, primarily politically, and is that, you know, as, as I look out there, you know, I still never fall a plus a struggle just like we came through in the 60s, 50s, and 70s. And I don't care about it. You know, when you look at all the parallels, when you look at, you know, we always compare Dr. King and Moses and Dr. King to God. You know, you look at these, these individuals, you say, well, they came so far, they didn't make it into the promised land. No, they didn't. Uh, but those that came after Dr. King, after his assassination in 1968, you know, we are the ones that have represented the, as being the reciprocals in the promised land. And now, when we look at the parallels as we go on backwards, that 40 years been pretty good, but from where I sit, the next 40 is not going to be as good as the last 40. The transition, when you mention transition, I take the position that many of us, especially that grew up right here in Montgomery, I'm going to personalize it, didn't have to go through a transition. 
You came up in a public school system, a high school system, where you had principals like C.T. Smiley, principals like Herman Harris, instructors like J.G. Pendarvis, C.T. Smiley, and others.